All right, well, let's pray together. God, thank you for the chance to be together this morning and to uh, worship and celebrate and learn and grow and love each other. Thank you for the, uh, the song that the kids just performed and for their hard work in that, for the blessing it is to all of us. We pray for your hand to be with uh, those who are sick and hurting today. We pray for your strength for them. And for us, as we gather together around your word right now, we pray for uh, your spirit to move in us and to teach us and uh, sustain us in our lives and the many things that we um, may be dealing with. We thank you, God, that you are faithful and consistent. And so we uh, submit ourselves to you now and ask for your, your uh, word to be lifted up and uh, to teach us and to strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy second week of Easter. And uh, <clears throat> it's good to see you all. Pardon me, I'm a little bit throaty this morning. I'll try to speak clearly and loudly, <clears throat> but I'm dealing with a cold, as many of you are. So, um, how many of you have seen the movie The Sixth Sense? A few of you? <laughs> Not very many. Okay, well, let me just give you a quick rundown, because uh, <clears throat> there's this <clears throat> picture. It stars Bruce Willis. It's an older movie. It's been around for a while. But basically, uh, and I'm going to give you a spoiler, so if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry. But um, <clears throat> in this movie, uh, the kid on the left uh, sees dead people, okay? So uh, anyway, it's, just, it, it's, just, it's got all these classic lines in it. And, um, but by the end of the movie, uh, <clears throat> you figure out that Bruce Willis, the main guy, uh, is actually one of those dead people. And he doesn't realize it until the very end of the movie. And you don't realize it either. Uh, if you haven't seen it. And then once he sees the, once, once that happens, it's one of those moments in a movie where suddenly, oh, the whole time we didn't know that and now we do. And so you look back and then you, then you review the entire movie and you see the whole thing differently, right? You go back and stuff starts making sense. And um, anyway, it's one of those movies that's got an apocalyptic moment in it where you uh, suddenly the lights come on and it's like oh and you go back uh, well the reason I'm using that as an illustration is the best thing I could think of to illustrate Mark's gospel in the in the scriptures is like that it's an apocalyptic narrative and in the uh, apocalyptic narrative of Mark's gospel we have a moment like that at the end of the gospel where the lights come on and so we're gonna look at that a little bit today um, when I say apocalyptic, um, probably a lot of things come to our minds that we have, you know, we've all heard the term apocalypse probably, and, and there's a couple definitions for an apocalypse. So the first one is uh, it's a universal or widespread destruction or disaster, and usually that's, you know, like the zombie films and the, uh, you know, the destructo, you know, meteors coming to, to destroy everything on earth or, uh, or, or some novel that, you know, talks about the end of the world. That's one kind of an apocalypse, and very often... That's, how the, that's what the Hollywood movies focus on, is that kind of an apocalypse, because we get all excited about those kinds of things. Um, but then there's, there's the, uh, the, the second definition, uh, or a second definition, is a, a prophetic revelation, uh, especially concerning a cataclysm in which the forces of good permanently triumph over the forces of evil. And this is a more biblical idea of apocalypse. So in the, in the scriptures, you have uh, apocalyptic books, right? Like Revelation is, is one of those. It's, it's very lots of symbol, lots of end time kind of pictures, destruction, good triumphing over evil and battle, and uh, the book of Daniel is another apocalyptic book. And Mark's gospel is, is apocalyptic. It's not like those two books uh, with all the symbol and imagery that's, that's used, but it's got an apocalyptic kind of narrative to it. Um, and so uh, it does have those, those moments of reveal. Uh, so uh, anyway, when we're looking at Mark's gospel today, um, we're going to look at the resurrection account in Mark 16. And uh, Jesus serves in this narrative as the apocalyptic figure, right? He is the apocalyptic, uh, eye-opening, 
uh, breaking in of the new thing uh, amongst the ordinary. And so Jesus, at the end of Mark's gospel, and really all through the gospel, um, but especially at the end, um, he becomes the revelation, kind of like the sixth sense, where he, suddenly we see Jesus, and then you look back, and the whole thing, if you're a reader and you're, you're, you're a listener, the, the, you're, the first time you're hearing Mark's gospel and you read it from beginning to end, suddenly everything becomes new. And you go back to the beginning and you, and you see the whole story differently after the light of Jesus makes sense. Does that make sense? So, uh, so this is kind of the, the framework of an apocalyptic narrative. And uh, I, wanna, I want you to keep that in your, in your minds as we're talking about this. Because um, we're looking at uh, the gospel story. We just celebrated Easter. And the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection event is the apocalyptic moment, right? It's the moment that changes everything. You, you see it, uh, nobody expects it, and then you go back to the beginning of the story and suddenly the whole story is seen in a whole new light. Jesus becomes this, this uh, figure who uh, makes everything look different after we, uh, after we can see the end and we can look back. Now for us who've heard the story, um, you know, we're quite familiar with this. Um, but if you can imagine yourself being a person who walked with Jesus or lived in the time of Jesus, this would have been uh, sort of their experience, an apocalyptic kind of, whoa, what is going on? We did not expect that. And now we can look back at the whole thing and see it very differently. So let's start at Mark chapter uh, 1, verse 9. My sermon is called Back to Galilee. Uh, <clears throat> and that'll make sense hopefully by the end. But at the beginning, uh, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. So this is one of those uh, moments in the story where the new is breaking into the old. And we have this all through, right? Jesus is, is demonstrating and manifesting the kingdom of God as he uh, lives and does, does ministry on the earth. And so we see uh, this ordinary, uh, the, what we would call the, 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 the present evil age, uh, in the scriptures, and then you have the, the, the kingdom of God breaking in to that ordinary reality. And so in this first uh, uh, instance here, Jesus is baptized, and then what happens? The heavens part, and the spirit descends like a dove, and it's this inbreaking, this moment of, 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 of God breaking into the present reality, doing a new thing. And so Jesus starts his ministry in Galilee, all right? He starts there in the Jordan, and he goes on uh, and does his ministry, and he does all kinds of miracles, he does all kinds of uh, healings, and teaches, and people are drawn to him, and this happens all the way up through chapter 9 in Mark's gospel. Um, he's opening up pockets of God's kingdom. You can, you can see Jesus healing somebody, and, and then he says, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Uh, he, and, he, and he forgives somebody's sins, he says, the, this is the kingdom of God, this is what it's like. Forgiveness of your sins. Uh, and so people are drawn, they're like, what is this new thing? And all through uh, chapter 9, it's like this. It's very, very um, exciting, very new, very um, positive for the most part. But then you get to chapter 10 in Mark's gospel, and things begin to turn. Jesus goes from Galilee, and he goes to Judea. And when Jesus goes to Judea, uh, he, is, he starts experiencing some, some real conflict. He starts experiencing the rejection of his own family, his own people. Uh, because they have different expectations around him. And the story begins to turn, and his dis even his disciples are, are beginning to be troubled by Jesus because he's talking about his own death. He starts saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered and crucified, and uh, he's going to be handed over. And they're like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? This isn't, this, we're, not, we're not following you, Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> so his disciples are troubled about this. Um, and Jesus later, in Mark chapter 14, says this. Uh, <coughs> After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So he started in Mark chapter 1 in Galilee. And then in Mark chapter 14, he says, After I have risen, I'm going I'm to go ahead of you back to Galilee. Okay? So uh, Jesus is, is uh, now experiencing all, all these dark powers, they, they're coming against him, the, the leaders are, are, are looking for ways to accuse him. His story has gone from one of, of, of positive and 
uh, favor with the people to one of rejection and downturn. And uh, he's, he's beginning to experience a lot of pushback. And he begins to talk about his death. The dark powers begin to swell and begin to look like they're going to win. And so they come around Jesus. Uh, they begin to, uh, to oppose him fiercely. Um, and then Jesus condemns the temple system, uh, makes his public pronouncement as the Messiah. He rides in to Jerusalem on a donkey, as we uh, looked at a couple of weeks ago on Palm Sunday, and uh, makes a very public declaration, I am the Messiah. And, uh, and, and the people uh, respond at first with favor, but then as he goes into uh, Jerusalem, he is very much uh, rejected. The dark powers uh, respond in violence, and Jesus is condemned and crucified. And so that's a brief overview of how Mark's gospel lays out the story. So let's go to our text in Mark chapter 16, uh, the final chapter. And let's just read it one more time uh, together just so it's fresh. So uh, Mark 16, beginning at verse 1. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, in your Bibles, you probably have um, verses uh, 9 through 20. Uh, and it's, there's probably a note there that says something about this uh, being uh, early manuscripts don't have this portion. Um, and so there's all kinds of ideas about what Mark's gospel originally contained as an ending. And I'm not going to get into all that. But just um, a lot of people think that the, the gospel may have originally ended at verse 8. And that the, some scribes may have added verses 9 through 20 later, or it was lost and recovered and whatever. We're going to focus on 1 through 8 today. So um, <clears throat> we're going to dig into the text a little bit, kind of have a Bible study. So if you've got your Bible and you want to open it, um, we're going to look at some of these verses and, uh, and, and kind, of, kind of reveal the apocalyptic moment, the climax of the story, um, as, as we're still focused on Easter uh, the cross and resurrection event as that eye-opening, revealing moment um, <clears throat> of the story. So looking first at verse 3. The women come to this tomb, right? And they are, they are uh, not expecting anything other than to, to find a dead body. Right? They're just, they're just coming to anoint the body. They, they want to honor Jesus. They walked with him. They expected him to be um, the Messiah and now they've concluded that he he must not be or at least if, if he was they don't understand and so they've come to anoint his body and they say as they as they walk up to the tomb verse 3 uh, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb who's going to move this gigantic stone so that we can actually anoint his body and uh, it's it's a it's a great question it, one of the things that we always want to ask when we're reading these stories is why did the author include that? Like why was that? Why did they put that in there? Is it really essential to the story? Well it must be because they put it in there. Uh, there must be something um, that, they're, that they're wanting us to see. Uh, so when, when, they, when they ask this question, who's going to roll the stone away? Uh, you know, I wonder, did they think about that before they like walked? The, I mean they knew there was going to be a big stone there. <laughs> or they weren't planning it. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they just weren't thinking about it until they got there, and then all of a sudden there's this big stone. You know, or, or where are all the other people who can help them move the stone if that's what they're going to do? Uh, but 
when we look at the text, um, they get to the tomb and the stone, verse 4, which was very large, had already been rolled away. So it's, it's not uh, people that who, who will roll the stone away. It's not people who will reveal the resurrected Christ. It is God who will do this. It's God who will bring about the salvation of mankind from start to finish. And just like God split the sky uh, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the, the Spirit descended, and just like God tore the curtain from top to bottom when Jesus died and, uh, and, and removed the barrier between God and man, it is God who rolls the stone away uh, and, and reveals the, the resurrected Christ and raises him up from the dead. It is God from start to finish who finishes our salvation. Uh, <clears throat> so the women go in and they, they go not to, anoint, not to see a resurrected body, but, but to anoint a dead body. And they are very surprised to see that the stone is rolled away. The, angels who, the angel who is sitting there uh, talks to them, saying, Don't be alarmed, verse 6. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then he says, Go tell his disciples uh, and Peter in verse 7. Now that word and, this is an interesting thing too. Go tell his disciples and Peter, right? Well, why does he do that? Because Peter's one of the disciples. Why doesn't he just say, go tell the disciples? Well, what did Peter do right before, right before Jesus died? He denied him, right? So, so he singles out Peter. And that word and uh, in, in the Greek is the is word chi, and it can sometimes be translated um, even. And, uh, and, and I think, and some scholars think that probably the better way to translate this here would be, go tell his disciples, his disciples even Peter. Right? To say, even, even the guy who denied me, even the guy who, who said he wanted nothing to do with me, go tell him that he's risen. Because, because God can restore anything. God can restore even the guy who totally dissociates himself from the Messiah right at, at the most important point that he needed to be there for him. God can, God can restore even that guy. Even Peter. Go tell him too. Verse 6, the one who was crucified. Uh, the one who was crucified. Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. So, uh, the, the one who is crucified. You, you, could, you could think about that as the one who, who died. And that was it. He's the one who was crucified. That guy. Um, but again, in, in, we don't quite get this in, in, our, uh, in our modern translations, but the, 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 the verb, the one who was crucified, is a, is a perfect passive in the Greek. And, it, and what that means is that you, you can do it two ways. You can, you can use it as it's, it's an event that happened in the past. Uh, and, and so it happened and, and that's it. It's history. Um, but when it's in the perfect passive tense, that means it happened in the past and it has ongoing effects into the present time. So the one who was crucified in the past, oh, that guy, uh, he was crucified. And that, that event of him being crucified, it has ongoing present effects into the, into the present time. Uh, that's the tense that the Greek uses right there. Uh, so to say that he wasn't just crucified, but the one who was crucified and changed everything. This is one of those ap apocalyptic moments, a revealing that's happening. Uh, this event has happened, and it's still affecting things right now. The event is happening still. The same thing could be, hap uh, could be said about verse 4 when it says, and the stone was rolled away. Uh, the very large stone had been rolled away. It happened in the past, but it's also in the perfect tense, meaning it has ongoing effects into the present time. There's a lot of verses like this in the scripture where the perfect tense is used. Um, and it, it, it's, it's actually quite helpful uh, when we can find what those are because there's really no good way to say it in English. There's no way for us to really know that unless we're looking at um, some background stuff on the text. Um, but another one that, that is uh, well known is I've been crucified in, in Galatians 2.20 when Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. 
and I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. That too, I have been crucified with Christ is, a, is in the perfect tense, meaning uh, it, it happened at a time, there was a time when Paul gave him, himself to Christ and it was in the past, but it has an ongoing effect into the present. I was crucified and I'm still crucified. And, I, and I'm ongoing. My life is not what's being lived here. It's, it's Christ living in me now. Um, so anyway, that's a, it's a really, um, for me, a powerful way uh, to think about what the intention of, of this text is saying, that there's an ongoing, there's a new thing that's ongoing and it's still happening. It's not just an event in history that happened that we talk about and celebrate. It has an ongoing reality in the present uh, because Jesus has changed things in his death and resurrection. New things have come in to the world. Uh, we live in a different reality because of the Easter event. It's not the same. Um, <clears throat> So Jesus uh, is identified as the one who has been crucified. The stone has been rolled away. Both of those are still affecting the world today. And then in verse 7, Jesus goes ahead into, the, into Galilee, it says. Uh, he says, go, go tell his disciples and Peter, uh, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. So, uh, we looked at verse 1, uh, or chapter 1, verse 9, where Jesus begins in Galilee, his ministry. And then he goes, uh, a little bit later in verse four, or chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, when I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And now in chapter 16, uh, the angel tells them, uh, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. So here's a map. <clears throat> Um, of Jesus' ministry. I know you're not going to be able to see all that, but here's the idea. Uh, you can kind of see where it says Galilee in that uh, kind of uh, peach colored or whatever square up there. Uh, and this is, this is the land where Jesus did his ministry uh, in, in Mark's gospel, the way it, he lays it out. So Jesus, you can just see Jesus goes all over Galilee, yeah, back and forth, different towns, different cities. And that's the first nine chapters of Mark. Um, he does his ministry in Galilee. And then starting in chapter 10, as we said, he then goes down south, uh, that little purple arrow on the left, he goes down to Judea. Oh yeah, good, who's got the pointer? Thank you. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and he goes down to Judea. And so that's where he spends his final days, right? He, he, he is then uh, condemned and crucified as he is rejected by his own people in Judea. Uh, and so now, uh, he began in Galilee. He tells his disciples, I'll meet you in Galilee. And then he goes down into Jerusalem. He's killed. And the angel says, when he raises up from the dead, he says, uh, and now uh, he's going to meet you back in Galilee. So, so, now it's interesting. The word Galilee means circle. So, you're going to do a circle. You're going to go back. You're, you're going to start, he's going to meet you in Galilee. And now, now, after the apocalyptic moment of the death and resurrection of Christ, after the whole story has come to a climax and everything has been redefined, now, go meet me back in Galilee. And I'm going to live my life through you as you, do, as you walk my path. You see what he's saying? So the disciples, uh, this whole thing that he did, and now I'm going, now you're going to follow me. Now follow me. In the power of the resurrection, in the, in the newness of the spirit, the resurrected Christ, I'm going to live my life through you as you walk my path. So he says, come back to Galilee. Let's start over. Let's start at the beginning, and let's, let's do this. He sends them on mission in the power of the spirit. Go back to Galilee. This is, this is the, the commission. Go back to Galilee. I will meet you there and you will see me. And notice what he says. Uh, he, he says, uh, after uh, I will meet you in Galilee, um, verse uh, 7, go, go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you. In other words, 
when you, when you go on mission, when you go back to the beginning and you start with Jesus and you, and you follow him, there you'll see him. You'll encounter and experience the resurrected Christ on mission. You don't sit back and observe the resurrected Christ and analyze and, and wonder if, if uh, you know, he's really the one that he says he is. And no, no, you follow him. You go on mission with Jesus and it's in the act of mission that we see him. Go back to Galilee and there you'll see me. There you'll see me. Follow me. The kingdom of God is not something to be observed. It's something to be lived. So walk it with him. Walk with him in the kingdom and, and uh, follow him into mission. And it's there that we will see him. Uh, <clears throat> it's important that um, we realize too that Jesus is ahead of us. As it says in uh, verse 7, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. He's preparing the way, right? Jesus is always preparing the way for us. He's always uh, doing the work. And then he invites us into it to participate in his work. It's not up to us to make the kingdom of God manifest. It's not up to us to make uh, things happen. But our job is to participate with what he is already doing in this world. Jesus is ahead of us in mission. And it's in mission that we will participate and we will see who he is and see how the kingdom of God operates as we do it. Um, <clears throat> so this is the challenge given to the disciples. Uh, trust me, go ahead, go back to Galilee. I'll meet you there and we'll do this. Um, and so what about these women? In verse 8, it says, Trembling and bewildered, uh, the women went out and they fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Um, and so this, this, uh, this, this might grab us like, well, that's a, if this was in fact the original ending of Mark's gospel, um, that's a strange way to end the story, right? I mean, he doesn't give an account of the resurrection. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about them seeing Jesus afterwards like the other Gospels talk about. You know, it's just they were afraid and they said nothing. Um, so what about that? Well, first of all, uh, women in the first century, um, from what we understand about that, they, they had absolutely no rights. They had absolutely no authority, no power. They were basically property of men. Uh, they could be divorced for any reason. Uh, if, a, if a woman uh, in the first century Jewish context, if, if she cooked a meal uh, that the man didn't like, that was grounds for divorce, right? I mean, this is, this is just the reality of what things were like in the first century. Unless you were a wealthy woman and you could, you could actually sustain yourself, which is not very common, um, we do encounter some women like that who, who support Jesus in his ministry, right? Some women who uh, it talks about in Luke's gospel who, who helped support him on his, uh, on his journey. Um, but unless you are independently wealthy, you, you're very, very dependent uh, upon um, the men in your life. And, uh, and so Jesus uh, actually confronts a lot of this in, uh, when he talks about... Um, marriage and divorce, for instance, when the rabbis ask him about that, he, he, um, he says that, you know, if you divorce the woman uh, for any reason, um, you're committing adultery. And he's, and he's aiming that at the men who are just casting women out of their life because, you know, they want a new wife. Uh, that's, that's what the thrust of that passage is about. Um, but anyway, women did not have rights. They didn't have power. They could be divorced for any reason. Um, very often the birth of a daughter was a disappointment because they can't carry on the father's name. Um, and they had a practice called exposing where they would um, sometimes just, just leave unwanted children out in the elements. And I mean, it's horrible, horrible things. But this is normal life in the first century. Uh, <clears throat> women's testimony wasn't valid in court. Um, and so they had very good reason to be afraid. And it's so interesting that they are the ones that are told to go and tell the story, <laughs> right? This is so awesome because this is, this is what God does. God is about redeeming the brokenness 
in our, in our humanity. I mean, women have been uh, second-class citizens for most of history. And uh, that's because of sin. That's because of awful uh, ways that, that we have set up society. And Jesus, <laughs> Jesus apparently wants them to be the witnesses. Um, Jürgen Molman wrote one time that uh, without women preachers, we would not have um, heard the, the resurrection story. I mean, it's just a, whoa, that's, that's right. Because if they, if they didn't tell people, <laughs> so women uh, had every reason to be afraid, to be trembling, and to, be, and, and to not do anything because why would anybody believe them anyway? And yet, here they're commissioned to go and tell the story, to tell the disciples. And of course, in the other accounts we read, they don't believe them until Jesus comes and stands in their midst. Um, it's another one of those details that makes the Gospels really believable. Because if you are making this up, you would use credible resources. Men. You wouldn't use women whose testimony wasn't valid in court. You wouldn't, you wouldn't write the story like this if you were making it up. Uh, <clears throat> they had great reasons to be afraid. But I think what Mark is doing in this gospel is he is he's leaving this thing hanging. Uh, the women, who are we to do this? The, we have no credibility with, with the people around us. We, they're not going to believe us. They're going to think we're crazy. Even men, they're going to think they're crazy. But especially, you know, we're, not, we're, we're lower than they are in, in the eyes of everybody. We're not going to have any, anybody believe us. So who are we to do this? Who are we to do this? And the gospel ends with this, these trembling, scared, women and then the scattered men who had all abandoned Jesus and the question is like well who's going to tell this story who's going to who's going to carry this on and so the, the the question comes back to the reader or the hearer in the in the case of the, the early hearers uh, will we go back to Galilee will we circle back and follow Jesus will, will we tell the story because throughout the whole story, the person who's hearing or reading the story has been with Jesus the entire time. We've heard the voice of God declare Jesus to be the Son. Uh, we were with Jesus in the wilderness when he was alone. Um, you know, we're reading the story and hearing it. Uh, we're with Jesus when his family and the religious leaders and the crowd all reject him and the disciples abandon him. We're still there as hearers in the story. So then the, the question is left. Uh, are you going to go back to Galilee? Will you see the resurrected Christ and go on mission with him? Will you let Jesus live his life through you? Will you go participate with him? So uh, the, <clears throat> the resurrection account in Mark's gospel is, is, uh, is, is baffling and unique. And it leaves the reader with this question. What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this story? Are, are you going to let fear keep you silent? Are you going to let uh, let the story be told by somebody else? Uh, will you go back to Galilee and go on mission with Jesus? Will you, will you demand that you see before you go on mission? Will you demand that God shows up in significant ways for you uh, to feel comfortable enough to step into mission? Or will you just go on mission, like he said, and, and trust that you'll see him as you go on mission? That's the questions we're left with. Um, as we continue in post-Easter uh, post gatherings here, uh, my prayer is that the resurrection will not, will, not, will not be last week. 
and, and it, it, we'll, we won't forget about it. We, we won't just leave it there and then move on to something else, but we'll soak in resurrection. We'll soak in crucifixion and resurrection and let that apocalyptic eye-opening event continue to shape us and push us into mission. Because this is what Jesus does immediately, right? He's resurrected. I mean, imagine, you have no clue about any of this. This is, this is a brand new thing and suddenly you're, you're, you encounter the resurrected Christ. And then Jesus is like, all right, let's go. Galilee, here we go. Mission. Let's go do this. <laughs> Wait, Jesus, I, I got to take this in here. You know, this is a little bit crazy. It's like, no, let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. So may God give us uh, boldness and uh, just simple obedience. Just, all right, let's go to Galilee. Let's circle back around. Let's start back at the beginning. Let's live his life. Let's let him live through us. Let's trust him along the way. And we'll see. We'll see on the way. All right, let's pray.